Hi, everyone. Welcome to our summer reading virtual series. My name is Caitlin, and I will be your host today. This year, our summer reading program is both in person and online, and we have some amazing events and programs, just like the one we're about to have right now. To join in the fun this summer, you'll need to do just a few things. The first thing is to sign up for your library card. So if you go to OCLS.info, backslash get your card. You can get your card right now. It is absolutely free and any age can get a library card. The second thing you're going to want to do to complete our challenge is join Beanstack. It's completely free. Sign up for your very own account at ocls.beanstack.org. Lastly, you want to register to attend some of our amazing events at ocls.info backslash events. Okay, this summer, the library is challenging you to read for just 20 minutes a day and keep a track of that in two ways, either through that online application Beanstack or through a paper reading tracker, which you can pick up at any of our library branch locations. What is really awesome is if you read for 300 minutes, you can pick up your very own goodie bag while supplies last. And if you complete the challenge and read for 600 minutes, you'll have a chance to win one of our amazing grand prizes. So for more information about this year's summer reading challenge, summer reading program, please check out our website at OCLS dot info backslash SRP. Then you can see all of our events, check out book recommendations and more. Okay, I know why you're all here today and I know you're so excited. So the time has come. We have invited Emily from the Netflix show, Emily's Wonder Lab to come meet with us today and talk more about science. So let's welcome Emily. Hi, Hi Emily. Everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Emily Kellandrelli. I'm the host of Emily's Wonder Lab on Netflix, online, on social media. People know me as the Space Gal. You can see that I am a little bit obsessed with all things science and space around here. And so I'm so excited to talk to you all today, to share with you my love of science, to talk to you about the jobs that I have and tell you a little bit about why I love space so much, because usually people are like, well, how did this all happen? How did you become the space gal? So I want to tell you the story of how that all happened. So as I mentioned, I'm known as the space gal online. This is because I studied aerospace engineering. I studied to become an aerospace engineer. I worked at NASA for a little while. And today I have a lot of different types of jobs. So first, I'm a science TV show host. Many of you may know me from my show on Netflix called Emily's Wonder Lab. I also worked with Bill Nye on his Netflix show, Bill Nye Saves the World. And I have a Saturday morning show called Exploration Outer Space that I've been the host of for the last eight years now. It's been it's been almost a decade. I've been that ho the host of that show for a very, very long time. So if you love space, Exploration Outer Space is another really fun TV show that you have to check out. I am also a children's book author, which I is it's such a passion of mine. I'm so, so excited to share with you these books. The Ada Lace Adventures is for kids ages six to 10. And Ada is a third grader who loves science and technology. And she goes on these adventures adventures to solve mysteries with science and technology and gadgets and gizmos that she builds herself. It's kind of like a book that I wish that I had when I was your age. It's a book about a girl that loves science and technology and goes on adventures. And I wish that I had a book like this when I was a kid. My latest book, Reach for the Stars, is my very first picture book. I wrote it after my daughter was born. My daughter is now two and a half, almost three years old now. And so I wrote that book about three years ago, right when she was born. That just came out a few months ago. And my latest book, uh, Stay Curious and Keep Exploring, is my very first science experiment book. It includes my 50 favorite science experiments that I've ever done. And it was inspired by Emily's Wonder Lab. So if you like Emily's Wonder Lab and you like doing science experiments and watching things bubble and get colorful and explode, then you're going to like stay curious and keep exploring. And then of course, uh, day to day, I am a content creator. I create science and space content across social media on 
TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and you name it, a little bit of YouTube too. I am I am everywhere at the Space Gal. And today it's so wild because who would have thought that this girl from West Virginia, I'm from Morgantown, West Virginia, um, the small, small-ish town would be working alongside of people like Will Smith and Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Bill Nye and Cardi B and that she'd be live on CNN addressing the president and asking him to change laws and working with Congress representatives to create bills and pass bills to change things to make our country better. Who would have thought that this would have all happened? Not me, because this is definitely not the career that I expected to have. I am not, uh, when I was growing up, I did not really consider myself one of the smart kids. I was from a college town. And so the kids at my school who were considered the smart kids, well, they had parents who were professors at the local university. Their parents were PhDs and they were scientists and engineers and they applied to all the top schools and they got into them. And I was not one of those kids. I didn't see myself as an engineer. I didn't see myself as a scientist. I didn't even really like science growing up. I got into science and I got into engineering because I wanted to make my parents proud. I am the first person in my family to pursue a degree in science or engineering. And when I was in high school, I knew that I wanted to get a really good job. I knew I wanted to make a good job and make good money and make my parents proud. So you know what I did? I Googled all of the different majors that somebody could study in college, and I looked at their starting salaries, and I learned that engineers made really good money. And so I thought, okay, I'll study engineering, and it's going to be really hard, and I'm probably going to hate it, but I'm going to end up with a good job at the end. And you know what? Something happened. I ended up absolutely loving engineering. I found the most incredible adventures of a lifetime by studying engineering. And one of them is this picture right here. So how did I go? How did I decide to go into aerospace engineering, right? That's how I decided to go into engineering. But why aerospace engineering? Now, aerospace means air and space. It means you study how things fly through the air, that's the aero part of it, and space, how things fly through space. So think airplanes and rockets. So how did I get interested in that? Well, when I was in college, I saw a poster on the wall that looked like this and had a student floating weightless. And it said on the poster something like, do your homework weightless. I remember thinking, what what does that mean? Do your homework weightless? And it turns out that it was a class that you could take if you wanted to study aerospace engineering. And in that class, you got with your friends and you designed a science experiment. And if your science experiment was good enough, then NASA would allow you to fly your science experiment on something called the Vomit Comet. Have you heard of the Vomit Comet? Have you ever heard of this? If you haven't heard of the Vomit Comet, I'm going to blow your mind. It is the coolest thing that you will ever learn about, and it is the reason that I decided to go into aerospace engineering. It is the reason that I eventually became the space gal. And I want to show you some clips of my flights, multiple flights now, that's plural. I I flew when I was in college, and now since I've had my TV show Exploration Outer Space, I have flown two more times. So here are some clips from my weightless experiment experience on board the Vomit Comet. Before we land, I have a few things left on my zero-g bucket list. A spacewalk, plus some acrobatics, snacking, and even juggling. Another dance move we need to try is the pirouette. On land, Sam's pirouette was smooth and effortless. Let's see how he does up here. Effortless, but not so smooth. Now it's my turn. Obviously not a professional dancer. Wow! 
maybe if we hold hands, we can have more control. <laughs> Not quite. That didn't work. <laughs> Wow. Here's another experiment, jumping through a hula hoop. <laughs> now that I've seen Sam's attempt, it's my turn. <laughs> Let's face it, if you're going to have a once in a lifetime experience, you might as well have some fun. <laughs> So you just watched the coolest thing that I have ever done in my life, which was fly on board the Vomit Comet. Now, a fun fact is when you get on the Vomit Comet, you wear a flight suit. And in that flight suit, you have a pocket right here. And in that pocket, you bring the most important tool that you will bring on that plane. Can you guess what that tool is? Can you make a guess? Maybe put it in the comments. Make a few guesses as to what you think the most important tool that you bring on the Vomit Comet is. If you guessed barf bag, you would be right. Because think about it. In this plane, there are people floating around and there are science experiments on that plane. Remember, that's the way that I got on the plane in the first place is I had a science experiment. And so if you are weightless and you throw up, where does that throw up go? Everywhere, right? It goes everywhere. And I don't know if you know this, but science experiments and electronics and barf, they don't mix. They don't want to be friends. They would prefer to be socially distanced, right? So if you throw up, you grab your bag. And by the way, everybody always asks, yes, I did. I did throw up only on my first flight, but I did. You grab your bag and you barf in your barf bag and you tie it off and then you hand it off to somebody who works there, which is not the most glamorous job, but it is a very important one. So Vomit Common is how I decided to go into aerospace engineering. And so in college, I studied mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. And then after I graduated from West Virginia University, I went to graduate school at a place called MIT, where I studied more aerospace engineering and something called science and technology policy. And after I was graduating from MIT, I got a call from a producer, a TV producer who asked me, do you want to be the host of a new space TV show? Which was a very, very cool call. I thought it was a prank call at first because it felt so random. I'd never done TV before. I had never done anything like that before. But all of my life, I've always said yes to adventure. I love things that seem a little bit scary, that seem a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And so I thought, let's give this a try. Let's see if this goes anywhere, right? And that show was Exploration Outer Space. That was eight years ago now. And that show has been renewed every single year since. And it was the show that launched my entire career exploration outer space. And I want to show you some clips of the past eight years of my work on this show. Once we got down, there's a platform down there that you can stand on. And once we got down, I was like, did I do it? This is so cool because that rocket is four hours away from sending a robot to Mars. To Mars. Okay, we are about to go into the elevator that's going to bring us down to the laboratory, which is nearly a mile underground. And it's about a 10 or 11 minute elevator yeah, ride. And it's a cage. And it's a cage. It's not an elevator, it's a cage. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> this is probably going to be the most extreme place I've ever seen anyone do science. She's literally pressed to the seat. Not only are Lee and I wearing real cosmonaut spacesuits, we'll also go inside a Soyuz spacecraft that crews use for flight simulation. Ah! Are we pulling what, like three Gs right now? Oh yeah, this. That keeps 
keeps the blood from draining down into my lower body. Your body feels things that it's never felt before. When you have G-forces pushing down and draining your head of the blood that is supposed to be there, I mean, that's a really weird feeling. Going upside down was my favorite part. It was actually really smooth, and you could see the entire earth circling around you. So you know how I mentioned saying yes to adventure? That feels like a, a life mantra for me. And if I could give you any life advice today, it would be to say yes to adventure. Because you know what? When I was putting that series of clips together to show you the coolest things that I have done over the last eight years, I realized something. I realized that for each of those things that I did, whether it be scuba diving to the depths of the ocean or flying in an experimental aircraft and doing flips in an aerobatic plane or going in a cage a mile underground, doing any of those things, jumping out of a plane, oh my goodness, I was scared right before I did any of those. Right before I did any of those adventures, there was a little voice in my head that was chirping at me saying, should you be doing this? Are you brave enough to do this? Right? And I realized that being brave doesn't mean that you don't have fear right? Being brave means you don't let those fears get in the way of what you want to do, of what you want to accomplish. And I learned that if you can't get over your fear, then just do it scared because your future self will thank you. And so one of my uh, favorite quotes from my book, Reach for the Stars, kind of um, illustrates this, this mantra, this life mantra quite nicely. And in that book I wrote, for being brave does not mean that nothing makes you scared. It means you never let your fear prevent the dreams you've dared. So don't let your fear prevent the dreams you've dared. And I have tried to follow that throughout my life. And so I had never written children's books before, but I thought, let's give this a try. And so I wrote the Ada Lace Adventures. I actually launched the third book in the series to Space Ada Lace, Take Me to Your Leader through the Storytime from Space program. So if anyone here is looking for a really great read aloud program to help with that 20 minutes of reading each day where you can read alongside an astronaut, you can go to storytimefromspace.com to find them reading all sorts of books. But the Ada Lace book um, is one that I'm particularly proud of because I wrote it. And so I was able to go to the launch and watch the book that I wrote launch into space to go to the International Space Station, which is so cool. Um, after I started doing my TV show, I started doing big public talks, which was really scary at first, but now I'm a professional speaker, which is so much fun. I get to talk to people like you. And then after I started doing my TV show, I started pitching other TV shows. I started pitching all sorts of science shows to major science networks. And you know what? I got some really sad feedback, really unfortunate feedback. Because a lot of the science networks today, it's mostly boys and men who watch them, right? It's mostly guys that watch them. And so my feedback, the people they, that I pitched to, they told me, well, we don't know if we want you to be the host of a new science show because most of the people who watch our shows are guys. And I don't know if they want a female host. And it made me really sad because I, I, I kept pitching these science shows and they kept saying, well, do you have a boyfriend or something who could co-host the show with you? Um, and it was really unfortunate. So you can imagine my surprise when I got the call from Netflix that said not only were they, they wanted my science show, but they were totally fine with me filming it nine months pregnant. I was nine months pregnant when I filmed Emily's Wonder Lab One for moment. Netflix. Oops. I, <laughs> I think my Siri thought I was talking to her on my phone. But I was nine months pregnant when I filmed that show. And so now there is a nine-month pregnant lady hosting a science show 
in 190 countries and 38 different languages on the largest streaming platform in the world. And I don't think I realized the impact that that would have on people who watched because it just isn't something that you see every day, right? It's because Representation is a very powerful thing. Not seeing people who look like you doing science can really impact you. And I didn't realize that when I was a kid, I didn't really see a lot of people who look like me doing science on TV or in movies or in books. And this is the type of representation that I hope to bring to the world. And so after Emily's Wonder Lab came out, girls across the country dressed up as me for Halloween because they wanted to be a scientist for Halloween. Kids all over the world have Emily's Wonder Lab themed birthday parties, science themed birthday parties, which I think is so fun. And this is the draw a scientist test. One family sent this homework assignment to me. It's from their son, Gavin. Their son, Gavin, was simply asked to draw a scientist. This is a really cool homework assignment that kids do all over the world and they've been doing it for decades and it's a way to try to see if kids have any type of stereotypes of scientists and so in the earlier days like a few decades ago a lot of kids would draw an old man with really crazy gray hair and glasses and he looked like Einstein like that well Gavin when he was asked to draw what he thought a scientist looked like he drew me he drew pregnant me as a scientist. And I thought that was so exciting. I thought that was really, really, really cool. And so today I share my love of science and space exploration across all of social media. I share all of the adventures I have at the Space Gal on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I share all of the reasons why I love space. And I wanna share with you three reasons today why I love space so much. And one of the reasons is because space technology, satellites, is making the World Wide Web, the internet, actually worldwide. Because did you know that only half of the world has access to the internet today? Only half of the world can log in to the internet which is really sad, right? The internet is a, such a powerful tool. And so satellite companies are launching more satellites that have ever been launched before to create the largest satellite constellation that's ever surrounded our planet. And they're doing this to make the World Wide Web actually worldwide, to beam the internet down from space. And once we do that, think of how the world will change. We can bring classrooms and educational materials to students all over the world, kind of like what we're doing today, where I'm talking about science and space and you guys are on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast. I'm in the Orange County in California. You guys are in the Orange County in Florida, right? So we can do this all across the world when we have internet all across the world. You can bring healthcare materials to people all across the world. Myself and my son were sick this week and you know what we did? We didn't have to go into the doctor. We used our phone. We used our phone to FaceTime the doctor and she looked at him through my phone because we had really good Wi-Fi. We could look at each other through the phone. And we could do this all over the world. You could bring really good healthcare materials and really good doctors all over the world virtually with space technology. The second reason I really love space right now that I think is so exciting is that we are now able to take an entirely new picture of the earth, an entirely new selfie of the earth every single day. Now, it wasn't that long ago that the only pictures we had of Earth were a couple years old. It's like if you were to take a photo of yourself in first grade, and then in third grade, and then in fifth grade, and then in seventh grade, and you, you weren't able to look in the mirror in between. You weren't able to see yourself in between. You would change so much in those two years. And that was like the information we had about the Earth, the satellites that we had only took a new picture of the Earth every couple years. Well, now there are so many satellites in space that we get a new picture of the Earth every single day. 
And the reason why that's so important is for things like, let's say, wildfires. That's really important here in California or even flooding in Florida, right? We can get a picture of how climate change is affecting our planet. We have the satellite eye view. We can predict when wildfires might happen. We can predict when flooding and hurricanes might happen because we have the satellite's eye view because of space technology. And the third reason that I think is just so incredibly exciting is space tourism. So have you ever heard of space tourism? This is so exciting because in the history of time, in the history of time, only around 600 some people have ever gone to space. Only 600 some. That's not a really high number, right? I had more people in my graduating class than that. That's not a very high number. And the people who have gone to space look all the same, right? They look very, very similar to each other. They're mostly boys. They're mostly white. They're mostly from the United States. They're mostly scientists and engineers. Not that many people have been able to go to space and the people who have gone are all very similar. So this is why space tourism is so exciting. If you've heard of companies like Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, they are now selling tickets into space. Now, it's not cheap. It's something on the order of like $500,000 to go to space. So it's certainly not cheap. It's very, very expensive. But once they start flying, they are going to double, triple, quadruple the number of people that have gone to space in our lifetime. They're going to start doing this very soon. Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are already flying people to space today. Isn't that so exciting? I personally really want to fly with a company like Blue Origin to go to space to see our planet from beyond our atmosphere because the astronauts who have gone to space and they have seen this view it changes them, right? Because they're able to see our planet without the borders that humans have created. They're able to see our planet with that paper thin atmosphere. They understand intuitively. It makes it really easy to understand how how we could be warming our planet with climate change because we just don't have that much air in our atmosphere, right? And when they come back from space, they want to be... Uh, an environmentalist. They want to help the earth better. And they also want to be a better neighbor to each other. And the people who have had this experience so far, they're mostly the same, right? And there's not that many of them. So space tourism is going to give this beautiful life-changing experience to more people and to different types of people. We're going to hopefully see people who are artists go to space. People who are maybe children's book authors go to space. People who are politicians, people who are teachers, people who are moms and dads and, and people who love to create things, right? We're going to see all different types of people go to space. And I'm really excited for the stories that they tell once they come back. And so now you have to ask yourself, would you go to space? If you were given a free ticket, would you go to space? Would you take that opportunity? I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes from my book. This is uh, an another quote from Reach for the Stars, and this is on the last page of the book. And this is what I hope that you all will do when you leave here today. The more you reach, the more you learn. There's so much here to do. Spread your wings. Reach for the stars. Adventure waits for you. So with that in mind, I hope you all stay curious and keep exploring. And I am so excited to take any questions that you all may have. Hi, friends. Wow, Emily, that was so amazing. I feel like I learned so much and I have a new goal to jump through a hula hoop in space. That was so cool. Um, friends at home, if you have any questions, please go ahead and write them in the chat. It looks like we got our first one. If you could go to any planet, Emily, which one would you visit? Ooh, that's a good one. I Well, I think Jupiter is one of my favorite planets. I have a Jupiter globe right here. Let me show you. 
This is one of my favorite planets because you can see the atmospheric swirls around the planet. It's just so beautiful. I feel like it looks like a painting and it's this cool combination of art and science. I love it so much. Jupiter is also the largest planet in our solar system, but it spins so, 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 so fast that it has the shortest day. So its day is only about 10 hours long. And I love that it is large, but it is nimble and it is quick and it's absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. So I would probably want to go around Jupiter and take a few pictures of it. We have another question. Hi, Emily, my daddy teaches astronomy and I would love to take him into space to see Earth. Could you please tell me how the Earth spins, asked Charlotte? Ooh, well, the the how the Earth spins. Let's see, this is definitely a better question maybe for your dad or a, a planetary scientist. Um, but yeah, well, for one, let me tell you about how the atmosphere spins in the planet. And one of the things that we covered on Emily's Wonder Lab that I think is really fascinating is because the Earth is spinning and the atmosphere is also spinning along with it, the hurricanes and tornadoes that we experience here on Earth, they'll spin in one direction in the northern hemisphere and a different direction in the southern hemisphere because of the Coriolis effect, which I think is really, really fascinating. And so a lot of people will ask, well, can you see the Coriolis effect in your toilet? Like when you flush your toilet, do all toilets spin the same way in the Northern Hemisphere, like in the United States? And then do they spin in the opposite direction in Australia? And if we had the perfect toilet that didn't have any cracks or bumps or anything else in it, and we place that toilet in the United States and had the exact same toilet and place it in Australia, then yes, it would flow in the opposite direction. But because when you look in your sink and you look in your toilet, it's not going to be perfect. You're going to have the water being pushed a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left, and it's not perfect. But with storms that are really, really big, like hurricanes and tornadoes, those will spin in the opposite direction, depending on if you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, because when you see the planets, they're moving counterclockwise, just like that. Thank you. Our friends at home, please keep asking questions. We'll try to do as many questions as we can today. Okay, we have another question. If you could be any kind of scientist, what would you be? Oh, let's see. I have a lot of friends who are different types of scientists. I have a friend who's an entomologist who studies bugs and his favorite bug is the butterfly. And I think it's really fun that wherever he goes, he can look in the ground and find insects or look in the trees and find all sorts of bugs and butterflies and birds and all of these things that he really understands that he knows really well. Um, I think that would be a cool one. I'm doing a renovation in my backyard and building a garden. And we're working with somebody who studied trees and plants. And I think that's really fascinating to know all of the different species of trees and plants and flowers and know how they grow and how their root systems work and what types of water and nutrients they need and sunlight they need. I think that's really, really fascinating. Um, but for me, I studied a lot of science as an aerospace engineer. So the type of scientist that I wanted to be was an aerospace engineer um, who used a lot of science in their work. We learn um, a lot about fluid dynamics, meaning how air would fly over an airplane or a rocket. Um, and so that that was the one that I really liked. But so I think probably something having to do with aerospace, maybe a planetary scientist to learn more about how planets work and how um, moons work and how our solar system functions. I think that would be really exciting, too. Good question. Thank you. That does sound really exciting. Emily, we have another question. Is space dangerous? Space is very, very dangerous. Um, so it depends on how you go. So any flight to space is going to be pretty dangerous because you have this rocket, this rocket that has a huge explosion downwards. And anytime you have 
a really big explosion like that, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be like a, a scary um, experience a little bit. And so it's kind of like if you were going to go bungee jumping, right? Most people who do bungee jumping are perfectly fine, but some people might get hurt. It's the same thing with going to space. Most people are perfectly fine, but it is a little dangerous. And once you get there, you have to make sure you stay in your space capsule. You have to make sure that you keep your helmet on because in space, there's no air to breathe, right? There's no air to breathe. So you have to bring your own air. And because there's no air, air is important for not just breathing. Air is important here on earth to put pressure on our bodies because you may not notice it, but the air around you in the room that you're sitting in is bearing down on you all over your body, everywhere, all the time. It's really, really heavy. It's about as heavy as a milk jug on the tip of your finger. That's how heavy it is. And people could ask, well, then why doesn't it crush us, right? Why doesn't the air crush us if it's so heavy? Well, that's because your bodies were built for this. They were designed for this. In fact, we need it to survive. And so when we go to space and we don't have that air pressure pushing down on us, we have to bring our own air pressure. That's why those spacesuits are so big and bulky. That It's kind of like they're in a balloon, like you're in a bodysuit balloon. And it makes it hard to move your arms because you can imagine if you put your arm through a balloon and you try to bend that balloon, that balloon would try to move your arm back outward. That's how spacesuits work. They're putting pressure on your body like a balloon. So you need air to breathe. There's no air in space. You need pressure on your body to keep all of the air in your lungs and all the air in your ears and all of that inside your body. So we need air pressure. Space doesn't have air pressure either. And then there's all the radiation and the temperature differences. If you're in the shade, it can be really, really cold. If you're in the sun, it can be really, really hot, way too hot. So there, space can be very dangerous. You have to bring a lot of stuff with you to keep you safe. Wow, I never thought of all the preparation that truly goes into going into space because um, you see the spacesuits, but there's a reason that they're worn. So we have another question. What is your favorite science experiment and why? Oh my goodness. So my favorite science experiment from Emily's Wonder Lab was probably Ooblek because when I was a kid, I made Ooblek with my mom, but I never knew the science behind it. I just knew that when you mix cornstarch and water, it felt funny, right? It felt funny. And so for anybody who's watched Emily's Wonder Lab, you saw that on the show, we created an entire pool filled with oobleck. And it was a dream come true because ever since I was little, I had played with it. And I always thought, how cool would it be if you had an entire pool filled with this stuff and then you tried to run across it? right? And so on the show, we filled an entire pool filled with it. And we challenged the kids to find a way to get across without sinking. And so the kids tried all sorts of things. They tried to go really slowly with fat, with flat feet to try to dis dis uh, distribute their weight. They tried to dance. They tried to hop. They tried to run. And the only way they could get across is when they put a lot of pressure on the oobleck so that the oobleck felt like a solid and not a liquid. And you didn't see this in the show, um, but because I was pregnant at the time and I made everybody nervous by doing this, but I was able to run across the pool of oobleck too after the cameras were done, after we, um, after we were done filming. And it was the best experience of my life. It was, it, it was so much fun. It was everything that I wished it would be and more. And so to this day, my daughter and I, um, who was a bump on the show, we make Ooblack together. And it just feels like a really fun full circle moment of me making it with my mom, making it on the show when she was in my belly and now making it with my daughter at home. Oh, that is so sweet. Um, friends at home, we have time for just one more question. Um, Emily would love to hear from all of you. So our last question is, how could I get started doing science? Uh, this is such a good question. Well, science is all around you all the time. And to get interested in science, you just simply have to think like a scientist. 
meaning you just have to be curious. You just have to be willing to ask questions and ask how things work and be willing to try to find the answer, right? Science is absolutely all around us and you can find really fun things to do with shows like Emily's Wonder Lab. You can find science experiment books. You can just go out in your backyard and look at the insects and the trees and the moon and the sky and all of these different things and, and figure out what you find interesting about it. Ask, why does the moon go through phases? Why do I see it during the daytime? Do I ever, when is the next uh, lunar eclipse, right? And figure out all of these questions and have your adult help you search for them online. That is how you get interested in science. That's how you practice science. That's how you practice thinking like a scientist. So just remember that science is all around you and never stop being curious about it. Well, thank you so much, Emily. We had such an amazing time with you. And thank you for answering our questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was great talking to you. Bye, Emily. We'll see you next Bye. time. Okay, for our friends at home, if you want to learn more about Emily, please check out her website at Space Space Lab Girl. And I want to thank all of you at home for joining us today. We have more fun live events just like this one on Facebook and YouTube every Thursday starting at 4 p.m. You don't want to miss next week's show. We will have the Everglades Foundation. You can find more information about all of our upcoming events on ocls.info backslash SRP. And don't forget to track your reading in Beanstack. I'm rooting for you and some of your friends to win some awesome prizes this summer. Finally, we would love to have your feedback. We read every single survey that we would free, uh, that we receive. Please let us know what you liked best about today's show at ocls.info backslash S uh, survey. <clears throat> and a big thank you to Window World of Central Florida for sponsoring our summer reading program. And a thank you. A thank you to you today for joining us. Stick around for a sneak peek at some of our cool prizes. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.